So this is a, a revolution in terms of aircraft design. If you think March 1936, when the Spitfire first flew, was also the month that uh, they had some, some big breakthroughs in terms of radar technology. And those two things were two big factors in Britain being able to win the Battle of Britain. So what was so good about the Spitfire's design? It was a very fast airplane. It was designed to meet the specification for a fighter that would fly at 250 miles an hour. And it actually went on to achieve 350 miles an hour in level flight. And they worked out it needed eight 303 caliber guns in the wings. Why eight? Because they reckoned you get a two second pass on a metal bomber. And they looked at the rate of fire of these guns and they said, we think you need, I think it was in the order of 250 bullets on target. So for that, you need eight guns. So the aircraft was designed around having four guns in each wing. As it turns out, those guns weren't quite enough to penetrate the armor that came along subsequently. So the 303 Brownings were replaced with 20 millimeter cannon, or at least um, 20 millimeter cannon were added. So if you look at the wing here, You've got two outboard 303 machine guns, and on a, an A wing, you'd have another one here and a fourth here. This is a C wing, so you've got the two outer 303s, and then you've got a 20 millimeter cannon inboard, and then any, um, you could have two 20 millimeter cannons in each wing, and then the E wing, stay with me, it gets more exciting. The E wing had 50 caliber machine guns uh, just outboard of the, the 20 millimeter cannon. Um, and on the stick, there are three buttons. The top button gives you the, um, the lighter machine guns. The bottom button gives you uh, the cannon. And then if you push the button in the middle, you let him have everything. And that, um, you've got enough bullets to last around about 12 seconds, which doesn't seem very much. But when you compare that to a modern fighter, we're looking at about three seconds these days with the rate of fire of, uh, of modern guns until, say, an F-35 runs out of bullets. So you really need to get in close before you shoot him. So when they said, see the whites of his eyes, that's what they meant. You had to make sure every bullet counted. And unlike the Messerschmitt, which had um, most of its armament on top of the engine or firing through the engine, so you didn't have any harmonization issues, with the Spitfire, with the guns in the wings, you had to harmonize the guns at a certain distance. So um, that was something else that Spitfire pilots had to think about. Um, in addition to, um, to those of the German contemporaries. What else did this have? It had flush rivets, so uh, it all helped it go fast, and it had a revolutionary radiator design that was sunk into the wing with a convergent-divergent duct, it says here. Uh, you can't really see it from... Um, it's the oil cooler this side and the radiator the other side. Um, in the Mark IX, they needed more cooling, so they put an extra radiator in the left wing, which is why the Mark IX has symmetrical-looking uh, radiators under the wings. In this Mark V, out of interest, um, because you've just got the one radiator, um, the glycol temperature on landing is typically 95 to 100 degrees. We need to shut the engine down by 110. So you've got about 30 seconds after landing before you turn the engine off. In a Mark IX with the two radiators, that, that problem goes away, and it's a much uh, easier aeroplane to, to handle on the ground, in terms of timing anyway. Um, what else did the aircraft have going for it? The Merlin engine clearly shared with the Hurricane and, and many other uh, contemporary aircraft, but a phenomenal engine. The only weakness is that it's liquid-cooled, so um, unlike a radial, which has a larger frontal cross-section, but is air-cooled, a liquid-cooled engine um, it means you're quite slippery because you have a, a low frontal cross section, but you've got this weakness in design of having a liquid tank somewhere. And if you take a bullet in the, the glycol tank, in this case, it's not long before the engine will overheat and stop. A great view from the Spitfire. Compared to the Messerschmitt 109, it feels like you're sitting in a coffin. Um, it's got a very heavy canopy, thick glass, and when you lower it, you know, it feels like quite a terminal act. Whereas, and the view out of it isn't great, you've got all these bars and bits of iron everywhere, and you're sitting really low in the aeroplane. The Spitfire, in contrast, you get a really good view. The only downside to the Spitfire's field of view is that because the nose is so long in front of you, if you're pulling to try and shoot a target, your bullets will fall away from you, so you can't see where the bullets are going to hit the bad guy. So the Hurricane's nose is a bit more steeply raked, so it's a little bit better in that regard in terms of being able to shoot people in the turn. Um, 
So just under 23,000 Spitfires and Seafires built. It was the only Allied fighter in production throughout the First World, sorry, the Second World War. Uh, and um, the difference in the Mark I to the, the very latest Marks was, was incredible. The Mark I had a 1,030 horsepower Merlin engine, and the, the later Marks were up at 2,340 for the Griffin. So, you know, well over twice the horsepower. The wing area didn't really change very much. So the latest Spitfire, latest version, was the equivalent of a Mark I with 32 passengers in terms of weight. So if you imagine what that does to the handling, it's, uh, it's quite significant. So the best handling of the Spitfires were generally the earlier ones, and this Mark V is, is the nicest I've flown. I haven't flown a one or a two, but this Mark V feels like a little light aircraft, so something like a, a racer, but you've also got guns. It's, uh, it's just a wonderful machine to fly. The clipped wings do give you a bit more rate of roll. So this was um, an LF-5, a low altitude fighter. And because it was uh, low altitude, they took the wingtips off to give you a little bit higher roll rate. It also means when you land it, it sits a bit better on the ground. There's no tendency to want to get airborne again because the wing is so efficient, it just never wants to stop flying. The flaps are a relatively simple design. They're just what we call split flaps. So they don't give you much increase in lift, but they give you a lot of increase in drag, which is one of the things you want for landing, but more lift would be good. If you imagine the flaps going down and the radiators under the wing being completely blocked by the flaps, that's the main factor that means you're so hot when you come into land um, in terms of radiator temperature. What else? She's a beauty. Um, so a little bit more difficult to handle on the ground than a Hurricane because the approach speed is higher. In a Hurricane, the wheels are quite widely spaced. In a Spitfire, they're close together, which means if you land with any sideways drift in a Spitfire, it'll want to tip a bit more on you. Um, and I think it was Mary Ellis who said she's a lady in the air and a bitch on the ground. Compared to a Messerschmitt, I think she's probably quite well mannered on the ground. Um, but I think once you've got the knack of flying a Spitfire, which doesn't take very long, uh, it's, it's relatively well behaved. Um, the only real difficulty, and if you think guys of the age of 19 were flying these in the war, some 18-year-olds, not too many, with only a handful of hours, and some of those guys were getting to the frontline squadrons without any Spitfire time because there weren't enough Spitfires around, um, they had to deal with a, a large power difference from the last aircraft they flew. And that's the thing that can get you into trouble, particularly on takeoff. If you put all the power in at once, the aircraft wants to go sideways. So you need to feed it in slowly so that you've got enough rudder to overcome all that torque. Um, but a delightful aeroplane to fly. Um, we're truly blessed to have this one with its, with its history. Uh, and it's, it's the nicest one I've flown. Um, so yeah, a real delight. Um, this week I've been flying the, the Silver Spitfire, which is going around the world shortly. Um, so we did um, three and a half hours in that on Friday, which I think was the, uh, the longest Spitfire flight since the 50s, we think. Um, and it's just the nicest aeroplane. It really is. So um, it's no wonder, really, that it has such a place in the nation's psyche. Even now, after, you know, sadly, all of our wartime veterans are starting to dwindle, um, people are still queuing up to, to fly in the back of Spitfires, which is, uh, tells, a, tells, a, tells a lot, really. Um, I've waffled on enough. What questions have you guys got? Yes. Talk us through a circuit. Okay. Um, so one of the difficulties with having a slippery aeroplane is slowing it down. So if I'm just pointing at an airfield, I've typically got over 250 miles an hour as I get to the airfield. I need to be below 160 miles an hour before I put the wheels down. So we would typically fly over the runway if the CAA let us a little bit lower than the circuit height. This is called a run-in and break, which they frown upon, but it's the safest way of getting a Spitfire back on the ground. And then you do a climbing turn onto the downwind using 2 to 3 G to get the speed back below 160, and generally that's speaking that works. And then I need to swap hands, push the gear lever up to activate the hydraulics, and then down to make the wheels come down. I'm checking for a green light. And then below 140 miles an hour, I'm putting the flaps down. Hopefully they come down in the air. And then I'm turning finals at about 95 miles an hour. I've probably got the canopy open with the door half open to stop the canopy from slamming closed if I have any uh, unexpected sudden deceleration. So 95 around the corner, looking to touch down at 85 miles an hour. 
The problem with the long nose is you can't see the runway in front of you, so a crosswind is actually a good thing because then the nose is out the way and I can see the runway. If there's no crosswind, or if I need to, well, if there's no crosswind, I'll try and fly a curved approach and then roll out at the last minute so I can always see the runway. And then before getting airborne, you need to have a good look at the um, good look in front of you to remind yourself what the view needs to be like when you touch down. So in the three-point attitude with the little wheel on the back on the ground, um, that attitude is quite critical. So 85 miles an hour, get that attitude, look out the sides of the cockpit to make sure the descent rate isn't too high, go to idle and uh, hold it. So um, that's it. What other questions? Yes, sir. Have I ever found myself in a tight spot in a Spitfire? Um, hmm, not yet, touch wood. I'm sure there's some wood in here somewhere. That's got to be wood. Um, no, not yet. The, I mean, there have been some interesting moments of being... Um, did my first Duxford Balbo last year, so 17 other Spitfires around you. Um, that, you know that was that was interesting, but yeah, all very middle of the envelope stuff. Um, the flight, the three and a half hour flight we did on Friday in the Silver Spitfire, that was the first time I'd flown with rear fuselage fuel, so it's got um, two rear fuselage tanks, which put the centre of gravity behind where we would normally fly it, which makes the aircraft unstable in pitch. So when you get airborne. You've really got to concentrate to keep the aircraft level because if you let go of the stick, it will do that or do that to the stool. Um, so that makes for interesting handling. But um, the handling is generally so good, uh, you know, if you ever find yourself in a tricky spot in the spit for us, generally because you put it there in the first place. Yes. So what power settings and entry speeds do we use for a typical display in the Mark V? We would generally set about plus six on the boost, so that's an indicator of what the supercharger is doing for you. And then about 2,600 RPM, 3,000 is, is the most it'll give you. Um, so that's giving you around about 1,300 horsepower. And we'll be diving in, and we'll probably have about 320 miles an hour for the first maneuver, which is generally either a fly past or a looping maneuver. Um, if you're experienced, you can loop from as low as 180 miles an hour, but normally it's about 250 and then rolling 250 is a good speed as well but you'll have more than that for at least the first half of the display and then for the fly pass bits of the display i'll generally come back on the pad to about plus 2 2200 to let the engine cool down before landing yes good question so do you ever get to relax while you're flying or is the weight and responsibility always at the front of your mind um there's a lot of retrospective enjoyment, so you do get to enjoy it because it's an amazing experience. But there are so many rules these days that you're trying not to break. Um, obviously, safety comes first, so we, we make sure it's a safe display, and then we overlay all those rules onto it. Um, so first and foremost, you're trying to not screw up, preserve the airplane, not overboost the engine, not cook the engine, all of these things. Um, and when you land uh, with a pint in your hand, I think that's when you uh, reflect on how much you actually enjoyed the trip. Yes. What's the stall speed? So typically, I've just been stalling a Mark 9, which is a bit heavier than this. But the Mark 9 stalls at uh, 73 miles an hour clean, about 65 with flap and gear down. So you've got a good 20 miles an hour on your last look speed as you touch down. But... Um, it, you know, it will stop in quite a short distance. 700 meters isn't unheard of. Nothing like the Hurricane, which has a much thicker wing. Yes, sir. My first Spitfire flight uh, was with uh, a guy called Matt Jones, who um, is a co-owner of the Bulby Flight Academy. And was that one in the back? I think it probably was. The first one is generally in the back, and then you move to the front if you're blessed with a two-seater. Um, so what had I flown? I'd flown yaks and things and some of the aircraft here, but, but nothing else Second World War at that stage. The power was, was definitely the thing that will stay with me. 
Um, we only go up to plus six boost for takeoff to preserve the engine. You've got plus 12 if you need it. Um, but even at plus six, you know, it's, it's quite a sparkling performer. But again, it's this um, retrospective enjoyment thing. You know, you're just trying to make a good impression. Don't screw anything up. Um, but yeah, it was uh, yeah, an amazing experience. And the second trip in the front was, uh, was the same again. And the solo. <laughs> and the solo, indeed. And the first single-seater, yeah, that's that's a special moment. Quick follow-up to that. You mentioned earlier about the low hours World War II pilot. How many hours did you have on your first big flight? Um, so, comparing with the low hours Second World War guys, how many hours did I have when I first flew it? Uh, probably about 4,000. Um, yeah, so... I'm a test pilot, so part of the test pilot training is putting yourself in the shoes of the lowest common denominator, so the the new to the front line guy, to be you know to ignore everything you've learnt and be able to say a new guy would find this difficult. So hopefully that training uh, has has meant that my experience didn't overly jaundice me or or pr over prepare me for it. But um, yeah, a different kettle of fish for sure. And how terrifying must it have been um, to be a war? And then your first flight in a Spitfire would probably be just a lull in the fighting. You've got one of the squadron's precious few aircraft. Uh, off you go. Don't bend it. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So the Sea Fire, how much did it differ? Not my specialist topic, actually. But if I extrapolate from the Sea Hurricane, um, it's been, I call it marinated because it upsets the Navy people. It's been marinated in terms of um, the. Does anyone know if they made the gear more, gear stronger? I don't think they did. Uh, later on, they, I think they changed the um, travel, made it a bit Changed the travel. Yeah, it wasn't so... Yeah, oh, that too, makes sense. Yeah, too, you know, deck landings didn't bounce too much. Yeah, so the biggest difference in terms of handling is the hook at the back. So it's an extra lump of metal which moves your centre of gravity further backwards, which makes the aircraft less stable in pitch. Um, so generally, they're not as nice to fly as the non-marinated contemporaries. <laughs> Um, but you need the hook to stop on the deck, it's where the food is, so... Uh, <laughs> any others? Yeah, that's a good point, thanks. Um, gentle, gentleman just mentioned the C547 is the last variant built, which had contra-rotating propellers, which means none of those torque effects um, will, will affect you at all, so they're all, they're all neutralised, which would make the handling a lot easier, particularly on the deck. Any others? Was, was I inspired by any of the Battle of Britain pilots? I'm, I'm constantly inspired by all of them. Um, we flew with a, a D-Day veteran the other day down at Leon Solent. He was 96, still sprightly. He's got way more charm than I will ever have. And um, he said uh, we were over the beaches. He was in a Mark V, so he said he scrapped in fives and he ferried nines. Um, and you know a lot of his squadron were, were shot down that day. Um, and none of them see themselves as anything special. They, did, they were just the lucky ones to survive. Um, but, uh, yeah, what it must have been like. Yeah, hats off to them, for sure. Inspired by all of them. Yes, ma'am. Have I got a wish list? Have I ticked them all off? Um, when I first flew a single-seat Spitfire, I thought, um, if I lose my medical tomorrow, I'll die happy. So we all want to fly every aeroplane that's out there just because every time you read the book then, you read it with that frame of reference. Oh, that, w that must have been what it was like. And it, it is fascinating. You, you go through and reread all of those books and it really brings it home what they must have been through. Um, so yes, I do have a wish list. Um, every airplane I haven't flown is on it. What's the best yet? Top three, Spitfire, F-35. Um, and then either the Jungmeister or the Harrier. The Harrier for the challenge, the Jungmeister, because it's delightful. Yes, sir. I had a list of things to research before standing here, and that was, the gentleman asked, the, the wartime history of this aircraft. Um, that was the one thing that I never got round to. Um, it did end up flying uh, from the New Forest, where I live, so um, I know that much, but it was, it was a 1943 aircraft, I think? So relatively... 1942? Okay, 1942. So the Mark 5s were generally 42, 43, the Mark 9s are 43, 44. Um, 
I can't remember. Does yeah, anyone... Check Air Force, they've still got the... It's check, yes, check. absolutely. Um, the Air Force did use... Was it a Czech squadron in yeah, the New 302. Forest? 302. 302. No, 310. Are you able to give us a 20 second potted history if I hand you the microphone? <laughs> Yeah, go cool. on, here you go. Well, well as, far, as far as I know, it was it's built in uh, 1942, um, and uh, I think that was the first. I think that was the first squadron it went for was uh, three, three, 312. Um, then, I mean, when it was restored in the 70s, it always had um, the 310 NN. Yeah. The first NND, yeah. and then NNA. And they found out the code was, you know, they made a mistake. Um, that's what it would have had. And um, basically, I think they. There's possible evidence that it might have well flown, um, you know, uh, escort missions with Memphis Bell, you know, Memphis Bell right, yeah. and those. And um, I think really it was, yeah, one of those things. I think by the end of the, you know, late war and that when it was out of squadron service, it ended up at Loughborough, you know, being as a training. Uh, from, and then it ended up um, in the Battle of Britain film, actually, you know, you know that, that was there. And from there it was um, restored by the Shuttleworth, you know, volunteers at Duxford. I think Neil Williams took it up for its first yeah. first flight. and. From, you know, it's, it's been in my memory ever since I used to come to these shows. Sorry, in the in the you know in the eighties, well, eighties when I was a kid and that. So yeah, it's always been one of those things, and you know you try and remember its history. But uh, yeah, but that's that's not probably the the best. Uh, point, but it's a little summary, I guess. Yeah, no, what, uh, but so yeah, well thanks. <laughs> that's thank you. I'll, I'll be I'll be corrected and uh, <laughs> challenged. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, uh, thank you all for listening. I uh, hope that's um, educated you on the handling side and also. The history, but the website's there if you, if you need more history. It's uh, it's all there, ready on my iPad to read. <laughs> Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you.